The Society for Hematopathology video tutorial is presented by Dr. Frank Lifuda, also known as Buddy Fuda. He's presenting a case of early T-cell precursor lymphoblastic leukemia. He's an associate professor of pathology and flow cytometry medical director at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Okay, so uh, the history on this case was a 30-year-old male uh, that had circulating blasts in his peripheral blood um, that was called suspicious for acute leukemia. A peripheral blood smear from low power, we see that there's uh, very few white blood cells scattered about. It's got a relatively high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. It's got uh, relatively smooth chromatin, and then you can see a couple small nucleoli in there. So really, this, this looks like it's some type of a blast. These made up 40% of the uh, total white cells in the peripheral blood. It is an acute leukemia of some sort. So uh, looking at the immunophenotype here, these uh, are the two physical parameters. Forward light scatter, which corresponds in general to cell size and uh, side scatter, also known as orthogonal light scatter, which uh, uh, corresponds uh, generally to uh, what we call cytoplasmic complexity. So we have two cell populations that we're gonna have colored. The population of interest, or the red painted cells here, um, uh, are uh, medium sized, um, and they do not have much uh, cytoplasmic complexity. Next plot here, we've got CD45 plotted against uh, side scatter, and we can see that our population of interest is in fact CD45 positive. Now it's dimly positive uh, in relation uh, to the uh, mature T cells that we have. This uh, particular plot, we've got the surface CD3 here. That red population is definitely shifting over on uh, the, the X axis uh, for the surface CD3, but I'm not 100% positive that's not due to artifacts. So a common problem with uh, flow cytometry in trying to determine whether something is positive or negative and uh, determining where your thresholds are. Uh, it's a little bit easier to do with uh, four color type flow cytometry. There's not as much interference between the different uh, channels and fluorochromes. But when you start to do 10 color, uh, eight, 10 uh, colors and beyond, you can get a lot of influence from uh, uh, different uh, channels and fluorochromes. The immunohistochemically stained slide, uh, you can see that there are um, uh, plenty of the cells in there that are staining uh, strongly with CD3, and I would presume that those are our normal mature T lymphocytes. Um, so there they are there. But you can also see that there are some cells in the background that are staining, or that appear to be staining dim for CD3. Um, so potentially that those could be our um, cells of interest that we're seeing in cytometry. And if we were to go ahead and look at a, uh, uh, a uh, preparation that was um, permeabilized to look at cytoplasmic CD3, we would see that um, our population of interest is in fact uh, uh, staying, staying positive by flow cytometry for cytoplasmic CD3. So that tells us we're, we're uh, dealing with uh, T lineage differentiation on these cells. Markers here, we have CD7, we have both the immunohistochemical stain slide and the uh, flow cytometry. And our cells of interest uh, are predominantly bright positive for CD7. So you can see the bulk of the cells actually have stronger staining for CD7 than the um, mature T cells. Uh, uh, CD4, uh, our population of interest uh, is clearly picking up CD4. It looks like it's uh, at the very least partial dim positive for CD4. Uh, here's TDT. This is a, a marker of immaturity. Um, um, and we can see on our flow cytometry plot, our population of interest is in fact TDT positive. So this tells us we are dealing with an immature uh, population. CD34 is another marker of immaturity. Uh, we can see that our population of interest is clearly positive for CD34. So we're thinking that this is probably uh, most likely a T lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, so when we look at some more markers, here we can see that uh, CD117 is also positive. Now CD117 is also, um, uh, can be considered a marker of immaturity in the correct context. Um, it's a marker that's usually seen uh, on myeloid leukemias um, because uh, it's a marker, it's, it's a, a stem cell marker uh, seen on uh, myeloblasts and promyelocytes normally.
Um, but here we have the flow cytometry plot showing that our population of interest is nicely positive for CD33, which is a myeloid marker, and it's partial positive for CD15, another myeloid marker. So at this point, our differential diagnosis opens up. We have to consider, could this be a mixed phenotype acute leukemia T myeloid? We have both T cell markers expressed we have, and uh, myeloid markers expressed. Uh, so we have uh, um, defined criteria to determine whether or not this is actually a mixed phenotype acute leukemia. So that's where I would start. I would start with thinking about that and seeing whether or not it actually meets that criteria. So then what markers do we have to consider at that point or at this point? Well, we have to look at myeloperoxidase, right? So uh, here we can see that the myeloperoxidase with the flow cytometry plot is negative and then uh, with the immunohistochemical staining, it's also negative. Now the other way to meet myeloid differentiation for mixed phenotype acute leukemia is to show monocytic differentiation. And although I don't have the, the plots to show you, um, the, uh, the monocytic markers in this case, uh, specifically CD14, CD11C, CD64, lysozyme, and nonspecific esterase were all negative. So this does not uh, uh, meet the criteria for the myeloid uh, differentiation in uh, consideration of mixed phenotype acute leukemia. So at this point then, it looks like we are truly dealing with a T lymphoblastic leukemia lymphoma. You go a little bit further, we can see, look at a few more T cell markers here, that uh, our population of interest is negative for CD8. It also, uh, by flow cytometry, is negative for CD5. Okay, so CD1A is a marker, uh, it's, it can also be considered a marker of immaturity when, uh, in uh, um, the context of T uh, lineage populations. Here it's negative. So overall, this is what we're left with uh, for the immunophenotype. Again, we saw that they were, they were expressed in cytoplasmic CD3, which uh, was kind of dim and variable. They were nicely bright positive for CD7. Uh, the TDT was positive, or CD1A negative, their CD5 negative, and their CD8 negative. Now we do have a myeloid marker expression. Uh, CD117 is positive, and the CD33 is positive. We did rule out again that uh, this is not a mixed phenotype acute leukemia. So overall, this is uh, consistent with a diagnosis of early T cell precursor acute lymphoblastic leukemia slash lymphoma. This was a new entity that was included in the World Health Organization 2017. This is a relatively uncommon disease. That these show a unique uh, phenotype indicating early T cell differentiation. Uh, this includes uh, positivity for one or more myeloid or stem cell markers. Um, those markers could include CD34, CD117, CD13, CD33, CD11B, or CD65. Um, it does show that it is committed to T-cell lineage by the expression or through the expression of uh, either cytoplasmic or less commonly surface CD3. <clears throat> These are negative for CD1A and CD8. <laughs> These leukemias can be either negative for CD5 or less than 75% of the total blast population positive for CD5. If these leukemias do show brighter expression of CD5 or they are uniformly positive for CD5, these could, they could be considered a near ETP ALL. Okay, so we can go over just like a basic simple algorithm. Once you determine that you're dealing with an acute leukemia uh, that is positive for both myeloid lineage markers and T lineage markers, um, you should consider uh, a mixed phenotype acute leukemia T slash myeloid. Um, the first thing that we could tackle is uh, whether or not it fits the MPOW criteria for T lineage. And that's quite simple. Um, for T lineage, it either has to have cytoplasmic CD3 or surface CD3. In our case here today, uh, we did have um, cytoplasmic CD3, so it did fit that. Uh, the next criteria that we would consider is the myeloid criteria. Um, what is required is that the leukemia show expression of myeloperoxidase or evidence of monocytic differentiation. In our case, we did not meet that criteria. At this point, you would start to consider, um, could this be a T lymphoblastic leukemia? Uh, anytime that we have a T lymphoblastic leukemia that expresses CD34, 
um, or any myeloid marker, uh, that should clue us off that maybe we're dealing with an early T-cell precursor acute lymphoblastic leukemia. For the ETPALL, you need to have CD7, which we had, and then they have to be negative for CD1A and CD8. And then, like we mentioned on the previous slide, uh, the CD5 should be uh, negative. That's exactly what we saw in this case. So this, uh, this nicely fits then into the category of early T-cell precursor uh, lymphoblastic leukemia.